So the energy levels for a rigid rotor uh, model are given by this expression. They depend on the quantum number L. And uh, this formula can be used. We've calculated energy levels for the first few of these uh, levels. And they get further and further apart as they go up. What we'll do now is, is take a closer look at this expression and uh, point out a few things. First of all, this quantity, if you uh, are particularly familiar with your uh, probably freshman year physics, the, this quantity might sound familiar. Mu times r squared, that's a quantity that we can give a name to in, uh, that's called the moment of inertia. And you don't necessarily need to remember that term from physics or need to have seen it before in physics. But remember what the uh, moment of inertia means is uh, for rotational motion, all, what matters for how difficult something is to rotate is not just its mass, but how far away it is from the axis that it's rotating. So for example, if I want to uh, uh, rotate this pen, it's a lot easier to, to rotate it at, on an axis close to my body than it is. It's harder to rotate it on an axis that's far from my body. So the, the moment of inertia tells us uh, uh, how to combine both the mass of the object and the distance away from the rotational axis for this rotating diatomic molecule that we're treating as a rigid rotor. Remember what we've done is instead of having atoms with masses m1 and m2 spinning around some center of mass, instead we've chosen to represent those as an object of mass mu rotating at some distance r, the bond length of the molecule, away from the center of mass. So the mass of this rotating object is mu. The distance away from the center of rotation is r. And mu r squared gives us the moment of inertia. So regardless of whether that uh, concept from a physics class you may have taken helps you understand this equation a little better, or whether you think of it as just a way of cleaning up the notation, we can write the energy levels for a, diatom for a rigid rotor in this form instead, where we've just combined the mu r squared into this variable i uh, as a shorthand. And sometimes you'll see these energy levels written in that way. Sometimes you'll see them, in fact, uh, written in a different formula. So this, this simplification uses moment of inertia. For another simplification, I'll remind you that Planck's constant shows up in a couple different forms, either as Planck's constant or as this reduced Planck's constant, h bar, which is the ordinary Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. So h bar squared would be h squared over 4 pi squared. That looks an awful lot like this h squared over 8 pi squared. We just have an extra factor of 2 in the denominator. So if we want to simplify things even more, instead of writing h squared over 8 pi squared, oftentimes we write h bar squared, leaving that extra factor of 2 in the denominator. And there's still an i, the moment of inertia, in the denominator. And I've still got an L times an L plus 1 that I haven't done anything with. That equation's gotten a little simpler still, so sometimes you'll see the expression written that way. It's simpler written in terms of h bar than an h. I'll continue mostly writing it with an h, but you'll often see it in the h bar form. And a lot of people like this expression because this h bar squared divided by twice a quantity that behaves a little bit like a mass but isn't quite like a mass is very similar to the form that energies uh, take in other systems like we've seen in the particle in a box that have h bar squared divided by, divided by twice something that feels a little bit like a mass. And if we want to continue this process, making this equation as simple looking as we can just by hiding different constants and variables inside of other redefined constants, we can take it all the way to an extreme. I'll define this quantity, b sub b, e, uh, which I'll call the rotational constant. Let's go ahead and take all these constants. So everything that multiplies the l and the l plus 1, let's go ahead and lump all those into one large constant. So let's let h squared over 8 pi squared mu r squared be this thing that we call the rotational constant. So with that definition, so whether we call it h squared over 8 pi squared mu r squared, or whether we use an i, h squared over 8 pi squared i, or we could even call it h bar squared 
over 2i. Those are all different definitions, different equivalent definitions of this rotational constant. With those, now all of the constants have been lumped into one. And I can say that the energy levels for this rigid rotor molecule are just the rotational constant times L times L plus one. So rather than constantly having to divide h squared by eight pi squared and so on, if we know the value of the rotational constant, then that makes the math a little bit simpler. So let's see how that works. Let's do an example. Let's take a molecule like carbon monoxide. So it's a diatomic molecule, different masses on one side than the other. That molecule can rotate. If we treat that rotating molecule with the rigid rotor model that we've developed these wave functions and energy levels for, um, I can tell you that the bond length of a carbon monoxide molecule is 1.13 angstroms. And maybe I would like to know what is the rotational constant for that carbon monoxide molecule. So notice I have to ask not just what is the rotational constant in general for all molecules everywhere, that rotational constant depends on the moment of inertia, depends on the reduced mass, depends on the uh, bond length of the molecule. So every different molecule, a carbon monoxide molecule, a nitrogen molecule, they all have different masses, they all have different bond lengths, so they're going to have different values of the rotational constant. That's going to be different for each individual species. So we can calculate, well, that's actually, in order to calculate the rotational constant, I'm going to need to know not just the bond length, which I've given you, uh, but the reduced mass of the molecule. So we have to calculate that first. The reduced mass for carbon monoxide, remember the definition of the reduced mass is mass of atom one times the mass of atom two divided by the, the sum of the two masses. For us, atom one is a carbon, atom two is an oxygen atom or vice versa. So if we calculate atomic masses, 12 grams per mole, for carbon to a couple sig figs at least, 16 for oxygen, 12 plus 16 would be 28 grams per mole for the carbon monoxide molecule. That's going to give us, calculator says, 6.86 grams per mole. So I'll stop there for a second and talk about that value. So. What does that mean that the reduced mass of a carbon monoxide molecule is 6.86 grams per mole? That's not the same as the mass of a carbon atom. It's not the same as the mass of an oxygen atom. It's lower, in fact, than either one of those. That's part of the reason we call it the reduced mass, is this mass is smaller than the masses of the atoms that I'm combining to make this molecule. Remember what the reduced mass means. This rotating carbon monoxide molecule that spins about its center of mass is equivalent in a physics, kinetic energy, angular momentum sort of sense, it's equivalent to a single point ro with mass 6.86 rotating around uh, a center, uh, the origin, with a bond length equal to the, uh, with a length equal to the bond length of the molecule. So it's at a larger moment arm. It's a larger distance away from the center of mass than either the carbon or the oxygen is. So in order to, to rotate equivalently, it has a lighter mass and a longer uh, rotational arm. But Mathematically, the reduced mass works out to this value of 6.86 grams per mole. We're going to need that value not in grams per mole, but in kilograms. So grams cancel, leave me kilograms, and I don't want moles. So I'll use Avogadro's number to get rid of moles. So grams cancel moles cancel, and in units of kilograms, the reduced mass of this molecule works out to be, of course, a very small number of, of kilograms, 1.14 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. That's the reduced mass of a carbon monoxide molecule. We can use that to calculate the rotational constant of the carbon monoxide molecule. So now I'll use this formula, h squared over 8 pi squared mu r squared. We know the values of all those quantities now. Planck's constant, 
8 pi squared, the reduced mass we've just calculated. I'll write all that out just so we can double check how the units work. And then the bond length, 1.13 angstroms. I've given it to you in angstroms, but an angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. So I'll convert that to SI units. And don't forget to square the bond length. So there's the quantities so we've written all in SI units, so units should cancel. In fact, we have a kilogram meters squared underneath the second squared. That's one uh, kilogram meters squared per second squared is a joule. So I've got joules in the denominator. That composite unit of joule will cancel one of these joules in the numerator, of which there are two, leaving me with, when I'm done, one unit of joules left in the numerator. And that makes sense because the unit on this quantity that we're calling the rotational constants, that should be in units of energy because if I just multiply that by some integers, I'll learn the energy of uh, my rotating molecule. So if we ask our calculator what that math works out to be, we find it's 3.82 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules. So that's a number, looks like a very small number. What that number tells us, now that we have this rotational constant, if we want to know the energy levels for this molecule, the math, once we have this number, has gotten a lot simpler. Remember, the ground state energy has, uh, the ground state energy level has an energy zero. The first state, constants times one times two. Now we can say in our new notation, that energy level is just two times the rotational constant. The next one up, two times three is six times the rotational constant, and then 12 times the rotational constant, and so on. So if we want to know any one of these energy levels, we just take this rotational constant and multiply it by 0 or 2 or 6 or 12 or 20 or whichever level we're interested in. So one advantage of, of knowing the rotational constant is now we have an easy way to calculate the energy levels themselves. We can also now ask ourselves these gaps between the energy levels. How big are they? 3.82 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules. Is that a big number? Is that a small number? Remember, the way to answer that question is to compare that energy to kT, to use kT as our, our benchmark for energies. So uh, in order to understand whether uh, this gap is large or small compared to kT, in other words, whether these energy levels are easily populated at, room te or at the temperature we're interested in or not easily populated, we have to compare those energies to kT and that's what we'll tackle next.